The world around us is in a continual state of change. Uh, positions of objects change with respect to time. That rate of change has a name. It's called velocity. Uh, velocities of objects change with respect to time. That rate of change has a name. It's called acceleration. The rate of change, uh, the, the radius of a balloon changes uh, with respect to the amount of air that you've blown into the balloon. That rate of change doesn't have a name. And still, we might be interested in it. So you just have to say the whole phrase, the rate of change of the radius of the balloon with respect to the volume. Uh, the price of lobsters with respect, changes with respect to the weight. The, um, the y-coordinate, if you're given a function, y equals f of x, the y-coordinate changes as a function with respect to x. Um, there, are lots, you know, there are lots of rates of change that go on every day in the world, or probably a near infinite number. And in this section of the book, what we're going to do is look at average rates of change, um, which hopefully will seem fairly familiar to you in many cases. Um, our goal is to start with average rates of change in this section and lead into a discussion of instantaneous rates of change, so an instantaneous velocity or instantaneous acceleration. Instantaneous rates of change is, is what the whole subject of differential calculus is about. But in this section, we're going to start with average rates of change. So there's a specific example I want to start with. So let's start with an example. Suppose a woman is driving along a straight road. and is at mile marker 37 at noon. Uh, before I go on, mile markers, many roads have mile markers alongside the road indicating how far you've come since some particular starting point of the road. So it's mile marker 37 at noon. Uh, suppose a woman is driving along a straight road as a mile marker. Then at, what do I want, 12.02 p.m. Exactly. She is at mile marker 38. My question is, what was the velocity of the car? Between times, well, let's say between noon and 12.02 p.m. So that's the question. And hopefully you know to ask, you know to ask the right question in response, which is, what do you mean the velocity of the car between noon and 12.02 p.m.? Do you mean something that you would read off of the speedometer? Um, like, so the velocity at, that you would observe if you were inside the car looking at the speedometer? Or do you mean, um, which would change, could change over the course of two minutes? Or do you mean an average calculation of the velocity? So just, oh, you went one mile in two minutes, so your average velocity was a mile in two minutes, or let me write the actual calculation. So, um, you could mean, what you could mean by, or what I could mean by that question is, um, you take 
the change in position over the change in time. And so you went one mile in two minutes. Well, that's one if we want miles per hour. So two minutes is one thirtieth of an hour. And so you would get 30 miles per hour. Is this the velocity between noon and 12.02 p.m.? Well, we try to be clear in math, and you don't want to say the velocity because people might interpret that in different ways. So we give this one a name. This is the average velocity the average velocity of the car between noon and 12.02 p.m. Right. So that's our definition of the average, uh, the average velocity, the change in position over the change in time. Um, I should make a little comment since I mentioned the speedometer in a car. Um, speed, there is a, when one speaks normally in English, frequently speed and velocity are used interchangeably. In math and in physics, it's important to make the distinction. Um, for motion in a straight line, like we're using, so on a straight road, the difference is whether you include um, Velocity could have a plus or minus sign. You pick one direction on the road to be the positive direction, the other direction to be the negative direction, and a positive velocity means you're moving in the positive direction, and a negative velocity means you're moving in the negative direction. Speed would just be the absolute value of the velocity. It's always positive. I'll say more about this later, but for right now, when I, when I talk about reading the velocity off of your speedometer, well, speedometer, you know, the name gives it away, it really measures speed. You need to pay attention to your direction. You need to like look out your windshield and pay attention to your direction to actually know your velocity, whether you're moving in the positive or negative direction. All right, so, um, right, the, the whole point of this example was this is an ambiguous question, and what you should say is what was the average velocity? Or you could ask for the other question, once we know what instantaneous velocity means, then velocity is just short. Once you have a notion of instantaneous velocity, then when one speaks about velocity, it really does just mean the instantaneous velocity, but we're not there yet, so we don't want, <laughs> we, don't, we don't have a notion of instantaneous velocity to talk about. Um, all right, um, I should make a big comment here because people, we have, the word average comes up certainly in calculus, average rates of change, but you might be used to calculating an average by, oh, what's the average of two numbers? Uh, you add the two numbers and divide by two. That is absolutely not what we are doing here. It is a huge mistake. Still, it's a fairly common mistake that students make. This is this average velocity of the car, this is not the sum of you know, half, not half the sum of two velocities. You don't, for instance, calculate the velocity, the instantaneous velocity at noon, the instantaneous velocity at 12.02, add them and divide by two. That is not at all what average velocity means, not half the sum of of two velocities. All right, that's my important warning. It's in red in the book. Um, we'd like to talk about other average rates of change, so it's helpful to write this in a different way and to introduce some notation. So let me do that. Um, all right, so suppose we let, in our car, moving down the road example, let P of T 
equal the position of the car on the road as measured by the mile markers. Position of car, this would be in miles, um, where t is in hours. Um, we could say that it's actually that t is 12 at the start and, and 12 and 1 30th um, at the second time that we care about. But I'll just say where t is in hours um, measured from noon. So that t equals 0 means noon. And t equals 1 30th means 12.02. Right. Then, what have we said the average velocity is? It's the change in position over the change in time. So, the average velocity is, let me abbreviate average, average velocity, I'll abbreviate velocity too. The average velocity is the change in P of T over the change in T, now that we have a function name and a variable name, and what we mean is, oh, you plug in, you take the position at time two minutes, so two minutes from one, oh, sorry, T is measured in hours, one thirtieth of an hour. You take the position at time one thirtieth of an hour, so measured from noon, minus the position at noon, but that's it, zero, divided by the change in time, which is one over thirty minus zero. Um, it's important that there are units here. The units here are the units of the numerator or the units of the denominator. So it's the units of the function divided by the units of the variable. So miles, miles an hour. So you get miles per hour. And then again, this is just 38 minus 37 over 1 30th. So this is 30 miles per hour. Great. I didn't really do anything can going from here to here except to write this in functional notation. I want to introduce one more piece of notation before I actually make the definition of the average rate of change. Uh, also, I have no idea why I didn't write change in t down here. This is supposed to say the change in p of t over the over the change in t. I don't know why I just wrote a t there. It's very strange. The change in t um, so, what, what do I want an abbreviation for? I want an abbreviation for change in both places. Um, and the, the symbol that's usually used is delta. So this is a, it's a triangle. This is a, a capital Greek delta. So this is a capital delta. And it's used as an abbreviation for change in. This seems to have been an abbreviation for a long time. I don't know where it originated. And so what we would write is something like the average velocity is the change in position. So we would just write delta position over delta time, or with the notation I had over there, delta of p of t, but frequently we suppress the of t. So the change in position over the change in time. Great. So that's the average velocity. And more generally, if you've got any function of a variable, we define the average rate of change of that function with respect to the variable. So our definition suppose you have the function name the function of variable names could in theory be essentially anything but kind of the favorite function name is f and the favorite variable name is x so I'm going to switch to f and x 
but here we had P and T, so don't think it has to be F and X, but, and I'll also let Y be the output from the function. Suppose Y equals F of X um, is, um, I'm going to say is, is a real function, and what I mean is that this variable, you give it real numbers, so the, the domain, of the, technically the domain of the function is a subset of the real numbers, so you give it a real number and it gives you back a real number, so these are real numbers. It's a real function that contains well, let me just say it's a, a real function. Um, let A and B let A and B be real numbers in the domain of F so you can evaluate F there and we'll assume that A is the smaller one so we, we don't want them to be equal and I'll let A be the smaller one then the average rate of change and we say average rate of change so much in this section and throughout calculus that uh, some people abbreviate it and I will I will abbreviate average rate of change as AROC capital A-R-O-C uh, the average rate of change of F with respect to X between X equals A and X equals B we also say or on the interval A, B. So we can say either one of those. And I should remind you, this notation for an interval, having the, the little, having the square brackets instead of the, the parentheses, um, means that you include the value of A and you include the value of B in the interval. Between X and is, and it's, it's this. It's the change in the function over the change in the variable. So it, you can write, del, if you've really written y equals f of x, you can write it's the change in y over the change in x, or you can write it's the change in f over the change in x. And what it means is you take f of b, you take how much f changes, so Take f of b minus f of a and you divide by how much x changes. And you divide by b minus a. Um, you can negate the numerator and denominator and see that it didn't matter which was bigger, which was smaller, a or b. It's a little weird <laughs> to write it in this order when you know b is greater than a. Um, algebraically it's the same, it just looks funny. You'll get a negative, well, you'll certainly have a negative in the denominator if you write it like this. Um, the units here, it is important to notice that if F has units and X has units, then the units on the average rate of change are the F units divided by the X units. So that's important. So this is our general definition of the average rate of change of one function, of a function of a variable. And if the function is position, and the variable denotes time, then yeah, that's called the average velocity. Okay, so let's, let's do another car example. 
So let's So in this example, I want to use that you have a preconceived notion of velocity, even though we haven't defined it as an instantaneous rate of change. You know that objects have velocities, and I'm going to appeal to that. Um, so suppose we have a car moving in a straight line. So a car. We have, <laughs> we have a car driving along a straight road. And I want to assume we know the following, that um, at Suppose at times t equals 0, 1, and 5 hours, we know that the velocities are, are 30, 60, and 40 miles per hour, respectively. All right, let me make some comments before I write the question. So uh, comments, first of all, we're talking about velocities, so we have to have picked a positive direction on the road um, um, so that we can talk about velocity possibly being positive or negative and knowing what positive velocity means. And this respectively means that at time zero hours, you are going 30 miles per hour. At time one hour, you're going 60 miles per hour. And after, at time five hours, you're going 40 miles per hour. We're not saying these are average velocities. We mean, <laughs> you looked at your speedometer. First of all, you noticed you were traveling in the positive direction. And you looked at your speedometer at, at time zero and saw, oh, I'm going 30 miles an hour. You looked at your speedometer at time one, oh, I'm going 60 miles per hour. And you looked at your speedometer at time uh, five hours and saw that you were going 40 miles per hour, respectively. What, the question is, what is your average acceleration? What is the average acceleration between times between times? 0 and t equals 0 and t equals 1 in hours. And then between, you could also ask between, well, you can ask a bunch of things, but between times 0 and 5, and between times 1 and 5. Okay, so what do you do? Well, first of all, I am assuming, well, either when I write the question like that, I'm assuming you have an idea of what average acceleration is. If you don't, well, then I'm, you're going to have to, I said it in the introduction that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. 
Um, so average acceleration is the average rate of change of velocity with respect to time. So you have to know that to, to do this problem. So what I've just said, um, average acceleration is the average rate of change, so that's the AROC, of velocity as a function of time, so with respect to time. Okay, so let's call velocity v of t, in, this is in miles per hour. I know I'm, I'm switching between writing miles per hour and mph, they both mean miles per hour. Um, and time is t in hours. So the average, so now we can calculate the average acceleration. Um, between t equals 0 and t equals 1, well, it means the average rate of change of the velocity, so we need the velocity at time 1 minus the velocity at time 0 divided by 1 minus 0. All right, and you're given that data. The velocity at time 1 is 60. The velocity at time 0 is 30. Divided by 1, you get 30 watts. All right, this was in miles per hour. The time is in hours, so miles per hour per hour. So you could write miles per hour per hour, or, or you could write miles per hour per hour. What a lot of people would write is miles per hour squared, doing algebra with the units. I frequently try to avoid this. Um, sometimes it's just too big a mess to leave it unsimplified, but you know, there's, there's physical content or physical intuition between, oh, miles per hour per hour. For every hour that goes by, your miles per hour, we're doing something. Miles per hour squared, you know, a square hour, what does a square hour mean? So just suggesting that, fine, you can do algebra with the units, and I will occasionally, but frequently I'll leave them expanded because I think that there's more physical intuition, more physical meaning there than you get from simplifying. All right, so that's the, between the average acceleration between time zero and one, between times 0 and 5, what do you get? Well, you just change this one to a 5. So you change this one to a 5, and this one to a 5. And then we have to go back and look up the velocity at time 5. We were told that was 40 miles per hour. And then divided by 5, so this is 10, 10, Divided by 5, well, that's just 2. So the average acceleration between times 0 and 5 is much smaller than the average acceleration between times 0 and 1. Um, what about between times 1 and 5? Um, so you change that to a 1, this to a 1, and this to a 1. So this is a 4. And at time 1, we're going 60, so this is, oh, this is a 4. So you get v at 5 is 40, v at 1 is 60, um, and then divided by 5 minus 1, so divided by 4. This is negative 20 divided by 4, so negative 5 miles per hour per hour. So you get a negative average acceleration. And you might, oh my god, what does that mean? It, it means you were decelerating on the average. You, um, that's all. The minus sign just means you were, your, your velocity went, um, went down between times 1 and 5. Well, yeah, it did. It went from 60 to 40. So you decelerated. And that's what the minus sign is doing there. All right. I want to, I want to emphasize 
that average rates of change come up in lots of everyday situations. And so I'm going to do a, a harder example right now, one that's algebraically harder, but the rate of change part of it's not any harder. Translating the, the physical problem into a, um, a math problem is kind of the hard part, but it's not that difficult. But let's do it. I want to do a problem about areas of television sets. <laughs> No, this is supposed to emphasize that average rates of change, or rates of change without the word average, come up in so many everyday situations that you don't even think about it frequently. But you would think about this if you were buying a new television. It's do you get more bang for your buck if you buy a bigger television? So I want to look at the following example. Calculate the average rate of change of a 16 by 9, it's a widescreen television, Um, the average rate of change of, <laughs> of sorry, uh, what's the rate of change of a television? Of the area, of the screen area, of a 16 by 9 widescreen TV there, with respect to the diagonal length, that's how they usually specify sizes of television sets. They just say, oh, it's 52 inches. Well, that means the diagonal length is 52 inches. What does that tell you the area is? Well, you have to know the aspect ratio of the television. The old ones were 4 by 3. More modern ones tend to be 16 by 9. With respect to the diagonal length, Um, let's give, go ahead and give the diagonal length a, ton, a name. Um, let's give the area a name with res, uh, of the screen area A. And this is with respect to the diagonal length D between um, some standard sizes of televisions between D equals 32 and D equals 40 inches. So both of those in inches. Or let's also look at between D equals 40 and D equals 52 inches. So we want <laughs> to look at those average rates of change. So as you know, you're going to get square inches, so we're going to measure the area in square inches. We're going to measure D in inches. This will be in inches. This will be in square inches, the area. And, you know, what we'd like to know is, okay, for every inch of diagonal that I go up, how many square inches of area do I gain? Um, so that's the kind of question you ask before buying a TV. Should I buy a bigger one? It's like, ah, suppose I want to double the area. Do I need to double di the diagonal? No, absolutely not. So let's, let's look at these average rates of change. Um, all right. This is the difficulty with this problem is writing a formula so that you can, for the area, of the television in terms of the diagonal length so, so that you can calculate anything. So like a lot of word problems, the first problem you encounter is how do you translate the words into a math problem? So this is my drawing of a 16 by 9 television screen. Being 16 by 9 means this side is 16 times something. 
Well, this side is nine times whatever, so that their ratio is it's 16 by nine. But in the diagonal is here. And the question is, what's the area of that thing, of that rectangle, in terms of D? Well, in terms of X, it's easy. So A equals the area. In terms of X, it's just the length times the, the width, or the length times the height, if you're thinking, picturing TV. 9 times 16 is 144, and then you get times X times X. So we're getting 144 X squared. Um, right, just this times this. You get 9 times 16, that's 144 times x squared. So that's the area as a function of x, but we want it in terms of d, the diagonal. And so we have to get a relationship between these sides with, that have x's in them and this diagonal. Well, you shouldn't have to think too long to think of, ah, this is a right triangle, that's the hypotenuse Pythagorean theorem. So Pythagorean theorem tells us, oh, 9x squared plus 16x quantity squared equals d squared. 9 squared is 81, so this is 81x squared. 16 squared is 256, so 256x squared equals d squared. 81 plus 256 is 337. So we get 337 x squared equals d squared. <laughs> if we solve for x squared down here, we get x squared is d squared divided by 337. And then if you put that in there, we finally get our, it's not very complicated, but the fraction certainly is ugly we get our formula for the area in terms of the diagonal. The area is one, so I'm taking the, let me, maybe I'll write the steps. We did this, but then because what we found in our last step was that, oh yeah, but x squared is d squared over 337. So what we get is a is proportional to d squared, but the proportionality constant is somewhat unattractive. It's 144 over 337 times d squared. Phew. That's the hard part of the problem. Translating the words into math or you know, getting the area as a function of the diagonal. But once you've done that, the average rate of change calculation is certainly easy or easy if you've got a calculator, because that nasty fraction is going to make things pretty nasty. The average rate of change, uh, let me write a rock of a between, with respect to x, uh, with respect to d, between d equals 32 and 40. So remember, A is in square inches, D is in inches. So this is A at 40 minus A at 32 over 40 minus 32. So we're using this formula. Forget, you know, go ahead, forget the X. We're not using X at all. These, are, these numbers are going in for D. So we get, well, you can pull out the whole, well, let me, I'll put it in, but then I'll factor it out. You get 144 over 337 times 40 squared minus 144 over 337 times 32 squared all over 8. So you get... You could simplify this and do part of it by hand if you really wanted to. Because you get, so this times, you can factor out 144 over 337 and get 40 squared minus 32 squared over 8. But you could do this part by hand, but dealing with this, I'm just going to cheat. If I had a calculator, maybe I'd use it. However, what's really true 
as I wrote down the answers ahead of time. Um, that if you actually get a decimal for this, you get that it's approximately 30.7656 square inches per inch. Right. This is, understand, I'm not canceling those and getting inches. Why? Because it's the average rate of change of area with respect to a diagonal length. So this means you get thir approximately 30.7656 five, eight square inches of area for every inch of diagonal. Yeah, you could cancel an inch and just write inches, but you would leave, you would eliminate a good bit of intuitive content. Um, so, and then you calculate between D equals 40 and D equals 52. Well, your calculation is, when you set it up the same, the numbers you plug in are different, but It, this, that average rate of change, that A rock, on that interval is, you would take, it's the change in A over the change in D, just like it was before, but the change in A now, and I'll go ahead and factor out the 144 over 337, which we did at the end over there, but you get A evaluated at 52, so you get a 52 squared, times this, but I factored it out, minus A evaluated at 40, you get 40 squared times this, but I factored it out, all over 52 minus 40, so that's 12, and if you calculate this, you get approximately 39.3116 square inches per inch. So yeah, when you're in the bigger sizes, from between 40 and 52 inches, the average rate of change of the, of the area of the television is at, um, as a function of the diagonal is actually bigger. So you're getting, for each inch, for a bigger television, for each inch you're gaining more area than you gain for each inch that you add to a smaller television. So. It means you want as big a TV as you can get <laughs> um, <laughs> within your budget. All right, so that's supposed to impress upon you that rates of change come up in all in various contexts that occur around the house, um, that occur in everyday life. Let's look at let's look at a more familiar mathematical example. It's will seem simple compared to the last one, but then I want to look at it graphically too to make a, to make a point. So here's an example. Let y equal f of x equal 4 minus x squared. So a nice simple function. We don't, we're not given a lot of words, no physical situation, no word problem to translate into a math problem. You're just given this function. Find the average rate of change of y with respect to x, the a rock. Um, on the intervals one two and one one point five. Okay. Well, these calculations are certainly nicer than the calculations we had to do in the last example. The problem seems very simple, but. It's the geometric point that I want to make after this that's important. Also, it is nice to know that if you're just handed a mathematical function in symbols and algebraic terms, that the problem is relatively easy. 
All this is asking for, this average rate of change, is the change in y over the change in x. Um, so that's, you can also say the change in f over the change in x. On 1, 2, it's f of 2 minus f of 1 over 2 minus 1. f of 2 is 0. f of 1, um, so f, f of 1 is 3 over 2 minus 1, that's 1. So we get minus 3. There are no units present, so you just leave it as this raw number, minus 3. So this is on 1, 2, on the interval from 1 to 2. And the AROC on the interval from 1 to 1 1.5 isn't much worse, although um, the change in y over the change in x. So same as the change in f over the change in x. It is f at 1.5 minus f at 1 over 1.5 minus 1. f at 1 1.5, um, f at 1.5 is 2 point, so 4 minus 2.25. Um, so we get a 1.75 minus minus f at 1, which is 3, over 0.5. Dividing by 0.5 is the same as multiplying by 2. So it's, this is what I'm saying is this is 2 times 1.75 minus 3. I'm just, I just like to avoid calculators as much as possible. Um, 2 times this, this is 3.5 minus 6. So minus 2.5. So those are the average rates of change, minus 3 and minus 2.5. You might ask, well, then what's the physical meaning of those? Well, there's not a physical problem here. So there's, you know, the, if you got this from a physical problem, then you might be able to give some physical meaning here. But what we can do without any physical problem around is at least give geometric meaning to the minus 3 and the minus 2.5. So let's, let's see what this has to do with anything geometric. So suppose we graph that function, y equals 4 minus x squared. You should know what that graph looks like. It's a parabola. It curves downward. Its vertex is at is on the y-axis at where y is 4. So without worrying too much about getting the scale completely right, it looks roughly like this. So this is supposed to be the graph of y equals 4 minus x squared. It'll hit the x-axis um, at x equals 2, certainly over here at x equals minus 2, but we're not worried about that part. In fact, I might as well erase it, but I guess I'll leave it there, just so it looks like I've got a whole parabola. What if you wanted to picture the average rates of change that we just calculated? So remember, we just calculated the average rates of change of y with respect to x on 1, 2, and the average rate of change on the interval from 1 to 1.5. How, how do you do it? Well, hopefully, since we wrote in both cases, it's the change in y over the change in x, change in y, this would ring a bell. Change in y over the change in x. You should have seen that in high school when you were looking at slopes of lines. Oh, the change in the y-coordinate or the change in the x-coordinate. So, okay, maybe we can write these rates of changes, these rates of, these rates of change, as slopes of some lines that have something to do with this graph. Well, yeah, you don't have to think terribly long to figure out what to do. If, if, if you look at when, when x is 1, then up here you get y is 3. So you have the point 1, 3 on the graph. 
And then you have the point when x is 2. Why am I using 1 and 2? Because the average rate of change here is f of 2 minus f of 1 over 2 minus 1. If I'm looking at this as the, the slope of a line, well, it's clear where the x-coordinates are. They're um, 1 and 2. The y-coordinates we want should be f of 1 and f of 2. So you take this point. This is 1 and f of 1. And you take this point, 2 and f of 2. So this is 2, 0. And what that, if you're interpreting this as the slope of a line, it's most naturally the slope of the line connecting those two points. And this, what we calculated before, our calculation of the, ins of the uh, average rate of change between x equals 1 and x equals 2, we got that it was 3. It means that this slope is minus 3. And if you use the x-coordinates 1 and 1 1.5, then instead you'd be taking this point, at 1, f of 1, and this point at 1.5, f at 1.5. This would be 1.5, f of 1.5. And you'd be calculating the slope of the line connecting those two points. And our calculation from before told us that that slope is minus That slope is minus 2.5. Uh, Great. So we want to give, because there's this geometric intuition, ah, how do you see average rates of change of a function? Well, if you have the graph of the function, the average rate of change that corresponds to two x values you go to the corresponding points on the graph, and you draw the line connecting them. And the slope of that line is the average rate of change. Well, we give names to these kinds of lines. Um, lines connecting two points on the graph are called secant lines of the function. So, so it's a definition, a line. It's called a secant line to the graph, or it's called a secant line for f. Um, and all we're saying is that slopes of secant lines give us, give us average rates of change of the function. Right. So that's the big deal. slope of the secant line slope of the secant line between well secant lines on the graph would go between a and f of a that's a point on the graph and b f of b where b is unequal to a, is, well, you know, it's just the change in y over the change in x. So it's f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And that's equal, which equals the average rate of change.
All right, I think I've beaten that into the ground enough that if you're just given a mathematical function, so y is f of x, so no other, no physical context for the problem, but you want to somehow see average rates of change or interpret them not physically, but at least geometrically, what do you do? You graph the, you graph the function, and then the average rates of change, the average rates of change are just the slopes of the corresponding secant lines. So that's nice. Um, all right, I'd like to do two more examples um, fairly quickly. Well, one example sounds complicated, looks complicated, you'd need a calculator to get an answer, but I just want to emphasize again that rates of change come up in lots of different contexts. Then I want to say, again, maybe more carefully, what average velocity, average acceleration, um, and average speed mean. And then, yeah, I want to look at a more complicated example. But first, let me do a quick, though messy, example of, um, <laughs> of blowing up a balloon. I mentioned it in the introduction. So this is not an example of drawing secant lines or looking at secant lines. This is just an example of another average rate of change that comes up in everyday life. You're blowing up a balloon. Typically, you can you exhale some volume of air, and you're trying to increase the radius of a balloon. And so I'm going to assume we have a balloon. We have a balloon. which stays perfectly spherical while being inflated. This is an ideal assumption, which stays perfectly spherical. While being inflated. What is the average rate of change, the A rock, of the radius of the balloon? With respect to volume, as the volume goes from 20 cubic inches to 30 cubic inches. All right. Well, <laughs> You, you have to know, or look up, a formula for the volume of a sphere as a function of the radius. Now, you may know one, you may know it, but it's the volume, so this is the volume, equals 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed. So that's the radius. But understand, we're looking at the radius as a function of the volume. And it's the volume that's supposed to be the independent variable for us. That means we need to solve for r in terms of v here. That means you multiply both sides by 3, divide by 4 pi, and you get r cubed equals 3v over 4 pi. And then you take cube roots of both sides. The cube root, taking the cube root is the same as raising to the 1 third power. So this is 3v over 4 pi to the 1 third power. Um, you can factor out the constant part, the 3 over 4 pi to the 1 third, if you want, <laughs> and get this is 3 over 4 pi to the 1 third times v to the 1 third. 
That's a constant. It's an ugly constant, but it's a constant. Well, now the problem is easy. This average, this A rock that we're after, <laughs> easy and ugly, this A rock that we're after is the change in R over the change in V. So between 20 and 30, so that means we want R at 30 minus R at 20 over 30 minus 20. This is in under, let's think about the units. I'm going to write them at the end, not now, but um, I'll at least mention right now the radius is in inches and the volume's in cubic inches. So the answer is going to be found inches per cubic inch. Yeah, you could simplify it to 1 over inches squared, but inches of radius per cubic inch of volume. Just leave it as inches per cubic inch. All right, so what do you get? Well, you can pull out this nasty constant if you want. You get 3 over 4 pi to the 1 third, but there's no way around the fact that you've then got 30 to the 1 third minus 20 to the 1 third over 30 minus 20, that's 10. <laughs> well, you could try to estimate this by hand. <laughs> I highly recommend a calculator. And what this comes out to be is 0 0.0243683 inches per cubic inch. Um, yeah, so the radius doesn't go up very fast per cubic inch of air that you blow in, as you may know if you've blown up any large balloons. All right, let's, I, I need to, I want to say a couple more words about uh, average velocity acceleration, then I want to do one more example. Well, maybe two more examples depending on how you count. Um, so, it, it, we're going to deal with motion in a straight line so often in this book that I want to say more carefully what we mean by position and then average velocity and average acceleration and average speed, which I haven't really, which I haven't talked about. So I said this before, and I'll but now I'm going to say it in a slightly different way. When, we, when I talked about a car moving in a, in a, along a straight road, I said pick one direction to be positive. Okay, mathematically what we need is to lay out a coordinate axis. So when we say moving along a straight road, you might as well think moving along a coordinate axis. So one of our axes, like the x-axis or something. And frequently we assume it's the x-axis, where you've picked a direction for the positive side, You've picked an origin, and you put, you start measuring positive numbers over this distances that way and positive distances this way. So when I say moving along in a straight line or moving along a straight road, I always mean that you should think of moving along coordinate axis, that we've placed a coordinate axis along the straight road. We've indicated a position as the origin, as the zero position, and we've indicated the positive direction and the negative direction. And then position just means the coordinate on the axis. So, you know, if you've called it the x-axis, it means it's x-coordinate, which could be positive or negative. Positive, positive position then would just mean some, some position over here. Negative position would mean some position over there. So that's what we mean by position when we're talking about motion in a straight line. Um, then average velocity is it is you know once position is well defined it's the average velocity is the rate the average rate of change of position with respect to time we've, we've I've now defined what position is for you uh, average rate of change of position with respect to time. Average acceleration. Now, I'll say again, this requires you to have some, somebody has to hand you velocities or you have some preconceived notion of velocity. 
other than average velocity. So it's the average rate of change of velocity. And we haven't defined instantaneous velocity because that comes up later in the book. But assuming you have a preconceived notion of it, or that you're just happy to work with it, if somebody says, and it had these velocities, then this is what you get. The average rate of change of velocity with respect to time. Average speed is something else. That it's not the same as average velocity. Average speed is it's the average rate of change, not of position. It's the average rate of change of distance traveled. So you can think total distance traveled, but distance traveled and total distance traveled, you know, same. Average rate of change of distance traveled with respect to time. So I want to give an example that emphasizes the difference between average speed and average velocity. Um, your distance traveled can only go up. Right? It's your total distance traveled. So if you move more, you travel more distance. So the average rate of change can only go up. Uh, sorry, your, your distance traveled can only go up which means the average rate of change has to be greater than or equal to zero. Your average speed has to be greater than or equal to zero. Your average velocity does not, if you're moving in the negative direction, your average velocity would be negative. Um, but let me give you a more startling example of the difference between average speed and average velocity. Suppose You travel sixty miles sixty miles on a straight road from point A to point B. in one hour. And then, you travel The average, what was your average velocity and what was your average speed? Well, so for the whole trip, well, for the average velocity, you take the change in position divided by the change in time. But for the whole trip, you went from point A to point B, and then from point B back to point A. Your final position and your initial position are the same. Your change in position is zero. <laughs> so, this, your average velocity is, is zero divided by two hours, but who cares? Um, but who cares? You get zero miles per hour because you began and ended at the same place. So your net change in position is zero. But your speed, your average speed, you traveled 120 miles. All right, this is the change in distance traveled over the change in time. 
but the distance traveled is 120 miles. Divide it, and then, yeah, you took two hours. So, of course, you average 60 miles per hour. Um, and if, if most people ask you, oh, what was your average velocity on some trip, even if it were a round trip, <laughs> they actually mean your average speed. They, mean, they want you to tell them 60 miles per hour. They don't want you to laugh and go, ha ha, my average velocity was zero because I started and stopped at the same place. But that's, <laughs> that's how ordinary humans speak. In, in calculus class, um, in physics classes, you need, to be, you need to distinguish between velocity and speed. Average velocity on such a trip, zero. Average speed, 60 miles per hour. You have to keep velocity and speed um, separate in your head. The distinction is extremely important if you turn around. If, if the object is always moving in what you're calling the positive direction, there's not going to be a difference. It's when you start turning around that there's a big difference. All right. I want to do one last example. Uh, just, it's just a quick average acceleration calculation. Three times, that makes it less quick, but still, velocity and acceleration are just fundamental concepts that calculus was developed to handle, so it is kind of Nice to do more velocity and acceleration examples. So, suppose a car. Suppose the position of a car So, we're going to assume it's moving in a straight line. So, the position is just a real number. It could be positive or negative. Suppose the position of a car in meters is given by P of T equals minus 1.5 T squared plus 9 T plus 5, where T is in seconds. Calculate. The average velocity. Velocities on the intervals. Zero to three. Two to three. And three to four. So in words, between time 0 and 3 seconds, between times 2 and 3 seconds, and between times 3 and 4 seconds. Um, what do you do? Maybe I won't work all of these out because I've been going on for quite a while and none of these are particularly difficult, but the average velocity. It's the change in position over the change in time. So on the interval from 0 to 3, you take the change in position over the change in time. This means p at 3 minus p at 0 over 3 minus 0. Um, so you plug in t is 3. You get minus 1.5 times 3 squared plus 9 times 3 plus 5. Minus what you get at 0, which is just 5, all divided by 3. Um, the 5's cancel. This is 27. This is 9 times negative 1.5, so negative 13.5, which is half of 27. So positive 13.5 over 3. 
So 4.5 units, um, um, meters per second. And then on the other intervals, um, you do the analogous things. You, on the interval from two to three, you plug in, um, on the interval from two to three, you'd plug in three and two. And so you'd put a two there and a one there and you'd make that calculation. And on the interval from four to three, you plug in four here and three here and take four minus three down here. You make that calculation. None of them are significantly harder than this. But the point is, once you've got a formula for the position as a function of time, you could calculate the average velocity on any interval that you're given. Um, instead of, in some earlier examples, I just gave you a fixed number of positions as functions of time, like three of them. Well, then there were only three, but there were only so many intervals you could, could calculate the average velocity on, not just. Um, but if you're given the position as a function of time by a formula like this, then you could calculate the average rate of change over any interval that you want, any interval whatsoever. And in the next section, that's going to be very important to us.